Okay, welcome guys. Uh, in this session, we are going to discuss about the glucose transporters. See, the glucose transport is basically divided into two types. Whether it requires the sodium or not, depending on that, we have two types of glucose transporter. One is called as the sodium independent, sodium independent, whereas the other one is referred as the sodium dependent. So we have the sodium dependent and the sodium independent glucose transporters. When it comes to sodium independent, they are basically written as GLUT, means glucose transporter, whereas the sodium dependent ones are written as sodium dependent glucose transporter that is written as SGLT, that is written as SGLT, that is the sodium dependent glucose transporter, SGLT and GLUT. So now uh, we are going to see the, the GLUT and the SGLT part, what is the difference between them. So first starting with the GLUT part. What is GLUT is? If I just give you a simple diagrammatic representation how the GLUT looks like. Let's say this is a seal and here is the glucose transporter. This is the GLUT. Now how it works is basically it is a facilitator of the transport of the glucose molecule. This is the glucose molecule. It can come, e come inside via this GLUT and at the same time this glucose molecule can bounce back and it can go outside. So basically GLUT is a molecule which is working in bi-directional way. So GLUT is a bi-directional gateway we can say it is bi-directional. Then we can say that it is working like a ping pong ball. The glucose molecule is coming and bouncing back and can go outside. So this is called as ping pong mechanism. It's called as ping pong mechanism. It does not require energy. It does not require energy. It is basically a passive type of uh, we can say transport that is occurring. So this is called as facilitative diffusion. This is called as facilitative diffusion. Means basically it is occurring across the concentration gradient and with the help of this transporter which is facilitating it. So it is called as facilitative diffusion. Diffusion is because of concentration gradient and facilitator because the glute is working as a facilitator. It does not require sodium. No sodium requires. No sodium required. So these are the these are the basic details of the glute. This is how the glute works. When it comes to the types of glute, the list is very long. We have around 12 types of glute. We do not have to discuss all the 12 types, but we'll discuss the important types of glute. When it comes to the types of glute, let's see the type one, type first, glute one. It is found where this is the point that they ask that where is the glute particular type of glute where it is found. GLUT1, it is found in RBC, brain and placenta. So GLUT1 is found in RBC, brain and placenta. Where is the GLUT2 is found? GLUT2, it is found in liver, beta cell of the pancreas, the basolateral side of the intestine, basolateral side of intestine. So these are the places where we have the GLUT2. Here itself I want you to understand what is the meaning of basolateral side. See if I make a cross section of the intestine. Let's say this is the cross section of the intestine. The, the wall of the intestine which is facing the lumen. This is called as the luminal side. This is called as luminal side. And the wall which is, which is there from the outside. If you take an intestinal segment and you go look from outside. That is the wall that is visible that is called as the basolateral side. Basolateral side. So the inner surface of the tube is called as the luminal and the outer covering is called as the basolateral side. On the basolateral side we are going to have the GLUT2. Now coming to the next one that is the GLUT3. GLUT3 is again found in the brain neurons. Then is the GLUT4 which is very important to remember. GLUT4, it is, it is uh, insulin dependent GLUT. This is the first time I am saying that any GLUT which is insulin dependent. Insulin dependent in other words I can say insulin sensitive. Insulin dependent or insulin sensitive is same that means that this GLUT will only work if the insulin is there. 
it will only express when the insulin is there right it is the insulin dependent gluten and it is found at three places and that is very important to remember that is the adipose tissue it is the adipose tissue the cardiac muscles and the skeletal muscle these are the three places where we are going to have the glut4 the adipose tissue the cardiac muscle and the skeletal muscle next is the glut5 it is found in the testes in the small intestine and it is for the fructose transport this glut helps in the transport of fructose so it is for the fructose transport for fructose transport next is the glut 6 it is non specific it is found in spleen then is the glut 7 it is found in the liver and basically it is for the transport of the glucose 6 phosphatase so writing uh, it is for the transport of glucose 6 phosphate for the transport of glucose 6 phosphate glut 7 the glut 8 it is found in the blastocyst it is seen in blastocyst this is also insulin dependent or again say insulin sensitive so the list is i am saying again the list is very long but at least you should remember these glut among these the most important one is the glut 2 and the glut 4 these are the most important glut 2 it is found where it is found in the brain uh, glut 2 is found in the liver beta cell of the pancreas and the basolateral side of the intestine whereas the glut 4 it is found in the of three places adipose tissue cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle and that is also insulin sensitive so these are the various glut that we have now coming to the sglt part this is all about the glut that we should know now coming to the sglt part sglt stands for the sodium dependent glucose transporter sodium dependent glucose transporter the the name itself is very clear that it is going to require sodium it is going to require sodium so let's write down this point that it requires sodium for the functioning the second thing is it also requires atp it is a active type of transport it requires sodium potassium atpase it is active type of transport it is going to require the sodium potassium atp as also let's see the types of sglt where it is found and how many types of sglt we have we have two types of sglt sglt 1 and 2 sglt 1 it is found in the luminal surface of the intestine luminal surface of intestine whereas the type 2 is found in the renal tubules type 2 is found in the renal tubules so we have we have two types we have two types one is the sglt1 and the next is the sglt2 sglt2 is in the renal tubules whereas the sglt1 is in the luminal surface sglt1 is in the luminal surface now what is the clinical implication of knowing these uh, the sglt1 and sglt2 and the luminal and the basolateral side let's understand this one by one So first starting with the SGLT2 part So we have written that it is found in the renal tubules it is found in the renal tubules so how it is going to help us once we are saying it is in the renal tubules means what for example let's say uh, this is the nephron now what happens is the glucose molecules will be filtered from the blood and will come here in the renal tubule now these glucose molecules which are coming in the renal tubules they are supposed to be absorbed back in the pct part only and they are supposed to be sent back all the way to the blood this is a normal physiology that is occurring in every one of us and this happens because of the molecule that is present in the renal tubule that is with the name of sglt2 
with the help of SGLT2, the glucose will be absorbed and will be sent to the blood. Right? This is the normal physiology. Now, if I say that, uh, let's say there is a patient of diabetes mellitus. If I say there is a patient of diabetes mellitus, means there is going to be increased glucose in the blood. If there is increased glucose in the blood, there will be more glucose that is coming in the renal tubule because it will be crossing the threshold. So, it will be coming in the renal tubule and with the help of SGLT2, it's, this glucose will be coming back. If this glucose will come back, again it is going to increase the glucose level more and more. This is a vicious cycle that will go on. The glucose will come into kidney, that will be absorbed, that will again go to the uh, blood and will increase the blood glucose level. So what we can do is, if there is a patient of diabetes mellitus and we want to treat it, then what we can do is, in the management of diabetes, in the management of diabetes mellitus, what we can do is, we can use a drug that is called as SGLT2 inhibitors. If you inhibit the SGLT2, then what you can easily appreciate that, this is not going to happen and the glucose is going to be remaining in the renal tubules and this glucose will be lost in the urine and this is what we want so that the blood glucose will decrease right so SGLT2 inhibitor the example of SGLT2 inhibitors that we have is the with the name of glyphosins glyphosins such as dafa glyphosin empa glyphosin these are the glyphosins that we have now it is just not the, that the, that the glucose is going to be lost along with the glucose because glucose is going to increase the osmolarity of the renal tubule. So what is going to happen is along with the glucose the water is also going to be lost more in the urine. Water is also going to be lost. If the water is going to be lost then what is going to happen is that the renal uh, because the water is going to be lost then what is going to happen is the plasma volume is going to be decreased. Right. So if there is a patient of heart failure for example is a patient of heart failure in which what is happening is that the heart is unable to pump the blood right because the volume of the blood is increased so what we use is we earlier we were using the diuretic we were using the diuretic so that the fluid will be lost and the the, the heart will be able to pump the blood whatever is the available now the volume of the blood will be decreased now here we have one more drug now in the management of heart failure that this anti-diabetic drug will have two actions. It is going to decrease the glucose level as well as it will decrease the plasma volume. So glyphosins just not just not only used in diabetes, it's not used only in diabetes, it's also used in the patient of heart failure because it is going to lose the lose the water and that is going to decrease the plasma volume, that is going to decrease the preload. So in the management of diabetes, we use SGLT2 inhibitor that is glyphosin, and glyphosins are also used in management of heart failure so this is one of the new recent advance that happened with the heart failure management that we can use one of the anti-diabetic drugs even the patient is not diabetic even the patient is not diabetic and he is having heart failure then also we can use the glyphosate this is uh, the first implication that we should know regarding the SGLT now let's understand the second implication to understand the second implication if I make a cross section of the intestine let's say this is the cross section of the intestine we know that this is the inner surface which is facing the lumen will have the brush borders. So I can say this is the luminal surface and here is the basolateral side. Luminal surface and the basolateral side. Now once we are clear with that, now what I can do is I just making uh, taking a segment out of that and enlarging it here. So that you will understand it better. If I enlarge the picture here, what you are going to appreciate is here is the basolateral side, and these are the the brush borders which are there, right? And this is the the lumen. This is the lumen. So I can say here is the luminal surface. This is the luminal surface that we have. The outer surface that we have is called as the basolateral side. Here is the basolateral side. And along the basolateral side, we are going to have the, the blood capillaries. So, by the orientation that we have taken, we have written that on the luminal side, we have SGLT1. And on the basolateral side, we have the GLUT2. This is what we have written. So, how it is going to work? See, when you take your meal, you are taking glucose in that. This glucose will come here in the lumen of the intestine it is supposed to be absorbed it is going to be absorbed via the SGLT1 SGLT1 is a sodium dependent glucose transporter means it is only going to work if the sodium is present so if 
the sodium is present at the same time in the intestine then only this SGLT1 will fire and these molecules will be absorbed glucose and sodium so it is not like that that if you just take glucose it will not be absorbed it is not going to absorb it will be only absorbed if the sodium is available there it is the, if the sodium if any of the one is absent let's say you want to absorb sodium and the glucose is not there then the sodium will not be absorbed so both has to be there simultaneously they will go inside and once they will reach in the intestinal wall this glucose will be sent to the near blood capillary via the glute so this is how the glucose is absorbed the, we are not concerned right now with the sodium so i am not discussing about the sodium more but what i am concerned is that how the glucose is uh, absorbed from all the way to the lumen of the intestine reaching to your blood right so first it will use the SGLT1 then it is going to use the GLUT2 and this is the same concept that is there in a uh, that is that is used in the uh, ORS see in ORS what happens is if you have ever tested the ORS it has the both both the tests are there sweet and salt there is the sodium is also there there is glucose is also there the reason of putting both the things together is because we know that they are only going to be absorbed if both are present if you just give one if you just give glucose it is not going to be absorbed if you just give sodium it is not going to be absorbed so that is why both has to be given simultaneously and then they will be absorbed and this is why in ORS we have both the test salt and sweet right so this is the second clinical implication that we should know regarding the glut regarding the glut so these are the points to be remembered when it comes to the glucose transporter which are the glucose sensitive transporters we have that are the glucose glut 4 glut 8 even glut 12 is also insulin sensitive when it comes to the SGLT part, what is the important thing that we need, should know is the SGLT2 inhibitors that are the glyphosates, they are used in diabetes as well as in the heart failure patient. So this is all about the GLUT. Now the, the next thing that we are going to discuss is the dietary fibers. Let's understand what is the dietary fiber is. What is the dietary fiber is? To understand the dietary fiber, Okay, so now we are going to discuss about the dietary fiber. What is dietary fiber is? See, these are the complex carbohydrates. These are the complex carbohydrates. Means what? What is the meaning of complex carbohydrate? Complex carbohydrate means those carbohydrates which cannot be digested by the human digestive system. We do not have the enzyme to digest that. That is called as complex carbohydrate. So they are also called as they are also called as non-starch. They are also called as non-starch polysaccharides. They are the non-starch polysaccharide or the complex carbohydrate. So the dietary fiber, the other name for them is the non-starch polysaccharides. These are the non-starch polysaccharide. So these dietary fibers are very important ingredient of our diet. These non-starch polysaccharide, they are divided into two types. Soluble or insoluble soluble or insoluble the when it comes to the soluble dietary fiber the example of soluble dietary fiber is mucin pectin gum alginate these are the soluble dietary fibers and when it comes to the insoluble dietary fibers that are the cellulose hemicellulose and lignin cellulose hemicellulose and lignin they are the uh, the insoluble dietary fibers that we have so dietary fibers can be divided into two categories soluble insoluble the, because there is combination of three whenever there is combination of three it is a potential all except question they ask that all of the following are soluble except all of the following are insoluble except so one should be aware that which one is soluble which one is insoluble uh, insoluble now, why one should eat dietary fiber every day in their diet? Why it is so important? See, what happens with the dietary fiber is, if I just give you the diagrammatic representation, let's say this is the GI tract. Now, when we eat the dietary fiber, when we eat the dietary fiber, they, these dietary fiber will go, will reach all the way to stomach. Because we do not have the enzyme to digest them. So, what they are going to do is, they are not going to be absorbed. And more or less they will reach same as it is in the column. Now once they will reach as it is in the column, they are going to increase the bulk of the stool. They are going to increase the bulk of the stool. So there will be less chances of the constipation and the, they will come as it is in the stool. This is a normal part, the normal physiology of the dietary fiber that more or less they are going to reach as it is in the column. And then they will be thrown out in the body by the, uh, by the stool. Now, sometimes what may happen is because uh, sometimes 
they may remain in the colon for a longer duration and if they remain longer duration in the colon in the colon we have something we call as the commensal bacteria now what these commensal bacteria can do is they can ferment the dietary fibers so we cannot digest them we cannot digest them but the commensal bacteria can ferment these dietary fibers see none of the dietary fiber that we have mentioned is is going to be digested none of them but most of them are going to be fermented most of them can be fermented so there is one dietary fiber there is one dietary fiber which is neither digested nor fermented there is one dietary fiber which is neither digested nor fermented the answer to that is lignin so let's write down this point that lignin is neither digested nor fermented So they ask this question that which dietary fiber is neither digested nor fermented? The answer is lignin. That it will not be digested. It will not be fermented. Right? Rest all are not digested. That is fine. But all of them are going to ferment except lignin. Except lignin. The next point that we should under uh, that we should know is that how much dietary fiber one should eat every day. One should eat how much dietary fiber every day. At least forty grams of dietary fiber should be taken every day on two thousand kilo calorie. means someone who is consuming 2000 kilo calorie then on every 2000 he must eat or he or she must eat 40 grams per day more or less every one of us every adult at least is almost consuming 2000 so every one of us at least should eat 40 grams per day 40 grams of dietary fibers now by eating that what is going to happen see the dietary fibers are going to decrease the risk of several diseases they are going to decrease the risk of several diseases because they are going to increase the bulk of the stool so i can see there are there is less chance of constipation if there is less chance of constipation means less chances of the hemorrhoids less chance of the rectal carcinomas so i can say there is decreased risk of hemorrhoids there is decreased risk of the rectal cancer the second thing is the dietary fiber have very less calorie the calorie in the dietary fiber is 2 calorie per gram only 2 calories are there per gram so it is very less it is very less so what i can say is because the calorie is very less so the chances of diabetes is very less if you are consuming more dietary fiber so the diabetes uh, risk is very less even the calories if you are consuming less the chances of diabetes is less so i can say there is less chances of coronary artery disease because the risk factor for coronary artery disease is one is diabetes another is excess calorie intake and both are decreasing with dietary fiber so there is going to be decrease or decreased risk of coronary artery disease so this is how that uh, dietary fiber is going to help in various ways in various ways so one should every day eat at least 40 grams of dietary fiber on every 2000 kilo calorie consumed 2000 kilo calorie and what are the various types of dietary fiber we have discussed can be soluble can be insoluble the dietary fiber which is neither digested nor fermented is the liquid okay thank you guys